assume everybody can hear me. Um, good, we're recording. Uh, hi, my name is Leslie Barrett. Uh, I am with the Bloomberg Law Division of Bloomberg, um, software engineer. And uh, it is my great pleasure to uh, introduce the first paper in our second section, which is a uh, second session rather, which is NLP application. And this is a uh, toward domain guided controllable summarization of privacy policies. Um, and uh, uh, Moniva Kamenesh will be presenting it. Moniva, I hope I pronounced her name okay. And uh, with that, please take it away. Hi, everyone. Um, can you hear me well? Yes. Okay, awesome. This is Moniba Kamenesh, and today I'll present uh, our work to our domain-guided controllable summarization of uh, privacy policies. Um, this work has been done uh, with uh, Professor Mika Elsner and Professor Trini Wansan and Professor Sarathi. Um, privacy policies and terms of service are unilateral contracts by which companies are um, required to inform users about their data collection, um, the processing and sharing practices. And uh, users are required to acknowledge that they have read and understood and accept the agreements before they can use any uh, service. However, uh, previous research has ind indicated that 97% of the users do not actually read these privacy policies and accept them without um, going through them. This behavior is often because these contracts are very long and uh, often difficult to understand. Previous research has estimated that um, it would take a user more than 200 hours to read all the pri uh, privacy policies that they would encounter in a year. Summarization uh, is an intuitive way to uh, assist users with conscious agreement by um, generating a condensed equivalent of the terms and uh, making users to just like uh, read um, a shorter version of the contracts. Generally speaking, um, the previous research on text summarization can be categorized as uh, unsupervised or supervised methods. Unsupervised methods uh, rely on a structural feature such as lexical repetition to extract important content um, uh, from the documents. However, these methods perform poorly on the legal language uh, expressed in the contracts. Supervised methods, on the other hand, can learn to cope with um, particular uh, features of a specific domain. Uh, however, these uh, uh, huge uh, neural summarization models with um, thousands of parameters are very data intensive to train. And currently, the legal, uh, legal summarization corpora is um, not sufficient to train such models. In this work, um, we extend the previous research on risk um, classification of uh, privacy policies by proposing a domain-guided uh, summarization model for um, summarizing the privacy policies. The main intuition behind our approach is that users, when going through the privacy policies, are more interested in knowing how their uh, information can potentially be abused. So um, a condensed equivalent of the term should, um, should uh, include such risky sections. Given the content of the privacy policy, um, the first um, module of our framework aims to predict the associated uh, risk uh, probability with each sentence of the contract. This is the um, responsibility of the risk prediction, which is basically a binary classifier, which aims to predict what's the probability of a sentence being a uh, dangerous data practice. Uh, next, given the uh, probability distribution over risk categories, uh, the redundancy reduction module uses two different um, reduction mechanisms to account for the desired length. Next, I'll explain our risk prediction module in more details. Um, we represent um, each token of each sentence of the contract with uh, a word representation that we get from a pre-trained um, um, word embedding method called ELMO, which is basically a, a deep uh, contextualized em uh, embedding method. We um, uh, concatenate the word vectors to build our sentence matrix. And um, next, we apply um, 
a convolutional neural model on uh, this sentence matrix. He applied uh, uh, convolution filters on the sentence matrix to extract new features. Um, we extract um, um, various features by uh, applying different kind of filters, um, which we uh, do by using different region sizes. Um, this uh, enables us to extract different features from bigrams, uh, trigrams, and so on. We use 50 filters for each of the region sizes, and uh, uh, to downsample the feature map, we apply a max pooling operation over a fixed uh, uh, length window size by getting the maximum value. At the end of the, this step, uh, we concatenate the resulting um, feature vectors to get um, our uh, final fixed length uh, vector, which will be then fed to a fully uh, connected softmax layer that predicts the probability distribution over the risk classes. Uh, next, given the probability distribution over the risk classes, which is uh, basically like how likely it is for a sentence to be a risky day practice, we apply um, two different content selection mechanisms uh, to account for the desired summary length. The first content selection mechanism, uh, which is the risk-focused um, mechanism, aims to extract the riskiest uh, content uh, um, and include them in a summary. So basically, we just uh, rank the uh, sentences based on their posterior uh, risk probability and include the uh, top K Riskier, uh, riskiest sentences to uh, build a summary with a budget of case sentences. Uh, the coverage-focused uh, mechanism, on the other hand, um, aims to include the riskiest content from different uh, pr privacy topics in a summary. We use uh, K-means clustering algorithm to uh, first identify uh, K different uh, privacy topics discussed uh, in the um, privacy policy, and then we include the riskiest content from each of the topics and include it in a summary. Uh, next, I'll explain the data set that we uh, use to train and evaluate our model. We rely on a crowdsourcing service called TOSDR, uh, which um, aims to rate and um, explain different sentences of um, the privacy policies. The, um, TOSTR contributors can uh, class uh, can rate different sentences, uh, different terms of these uh, contracts as good, neutral, blocker, or bad, uh, which are the ratings over here. And they can also write uh, a summary or explain the terms uh, in a short sentence. To build our own data set, we extract the terms of service, quickie policy, and privacy policy of 151 uh, companies uh, that have a record on TOSDR. These uh, contracts are on average more than 400 sentences long. Uh, to label uh, the full content of the privacy policies using the f um, very few sentences of that uh, which are labeled on TOSDR, we uh, compare each sentence of the privacy policy with the annotated ones on TOSDR. If the same sentence or a very similar sentence was annotated on TOSDR, we assign the same label to it. Otherwise, uh, we will assign a neutral label to it. And uh, the main um, assumption be uh, behind our uh, annotation schema is that if a sentence is explaining a dangerous data practice, it's most, li uh, it's most likely rated by the TOSDR members, and um, if it's not, it's probably or labels. We aggregate the good and neutral labels um, to get uh, the non-risky class, and we also aggregate the um, bad and blocker um, um, snippets to get the uh, risky class. Uh, as you can see, this data set is highly imbalanced with more than 61k non-risky sentences and only around 700 risky snippets. To build uh, our ground truth um, summaries, we concatenate um, the content of all the risky um, sections of privacy policies. This builds our code text summary. We also concatenate the planning list summaries that uh, TOSDR contributors have written for the risky um, snippets uh, of the privacy policies, uh, and this builds our plain English reference summary. These summaries are an average uh, 3.5 um, sentences long. Uh, as I mentioned before, our data set is highly imbalanced. To account for the imbalanced problem, we 
undersampled the majority class uh, by a rate of 10%, and we used a small oversampling technique to oversample the minority class. Uh, our training um, aims to uh, optimize the binary cross entropy loss, and we um, weight our loss inversely proportional to class frequencies in our training data. In our experiments, we aim to answer two questions. First, we want to know how well does our model uh, perform in uh, identifying the risky um, snippets in a contract. And second, we want to know which content selection mechanism um, extracts summaries that are more human-like. To answer the first question, we report the micro and micro um, F1 score of our risk classifier. And to answer the um, second um, question, we measure the quality of the extracted summaries by computing the average uh, F score of uh, ROJ1, uh, ROJ2, and ROJ L, which respectively are um, unigram uh, uh, overlap, bigram overlap, and longest common sequence between the reference summary and the summary to be evaluated. We also report the meteor score, which goes beyond the surface matches and accounts for stems and synonyms. We evaluate our model using five-fold uh, five cross-validation and um, compare the performance of our model with uh, a few uh, extractive and unsupervised baselines. The first baseline is text rank, which uses a page rank log, uh, algorithm to um, compute an important score for each sentence and then uh, uh, includes the most important ones um, to meet a summarization budget until uh, uh, a summarization budget is met. The second uh, baseline is KLSUM, which greedily includes sentences from the uh, input document in a summary until the um, KL uh, divergence of the input uh, document and uh, the extracted summary is minimized. Um, the last uh, baseline is lead K, which is a very popular uh, ba uh, baseline for new summarization, which uh, basically includes the first K sentences of um, a document um, in a summary until a word limit is met. <laughs> In this table, you can see our classification results. We evaluate our model in two different compression ratios. Compression ratio is basically um, the desired length of the summary. We use compression ratio of 1 over 64 and 1 over 16. As you can see in the table, um, the micro F1 values uh, achieved by both variations of our model, the risk focus and the coverage focus are pretty high. Um, and the highest macro F1 value is achieved by the risk-focused uh, model. And the large uh, gap between these two values uh, is um, due to the class imbalance. Um, I also will present our summarization results using two types of reference summaries, the Cotex and the plain English summaries. Uh, as you can see in this uh, table, at compression ratio of 1 over 64, both variations of our model outperform the baselines and increasing the Roche 1 score by 14.3 um, points over the best performing baseline, in which in this case was KLSOM. Uh, we also increased the Meteor score by 16.6 um, points, and these results are statistically significant. Um, we also... Um, evaluate our model using another type of reference summary, which are plain English summaries written by TOSTR contributors for the risky sections of the contract. We add um, additional uh, an additional baseline here, which is called upper bound. Um, the idea behind adding this baseline was that what if we have a perfect classifier that identifies all the risky sections of the contracts, and we wanted to see how how much overlap is between the actual content of the risky sections and um, the uh, abstractive summaries written by uh, TOSDR members. As you can see um, in this table, um, the upper bound baseline results are also um, pretty low, which indicates that plain, plain English summaries are highly abstractive and the wording is very different from uh, the actual content uh, of the privacy policies. Um, in this experiment, both variations of our model outperform the baselines. However, these results are not statistically significant. 
To conclude, in this work, we used a risk classifier for content selection, and we showed that uh, using this risk classifier improves the summarization results over unsupervised uh, extractive baselines. Training this risk classifier requires much uh, less training data than training an abstractive summarization model. The idea of using a classifier for content selection can benefit other low resource domains as well. Um, users can use uh, this model to control the um, to generate a um, summary by controlling the length of the summary as well as controlling the content uh, selection mechanism. We share um, the annotated uh, data set of uh, 151 uh, privacy policies annotated with risk classes um, uh, with the research community. Um, I think, mm, okay. So um, our method can be improved um, in a few ways. First, uh, by improving the risk classification module and also um, building a model that can do some abstractions. Obviously, there are a few challenges with this, uh, the unabstracted model, which are um, um, limited summarization resources and also um, abstraction might uh, uh, change the comprehension of the content, which is not acceptable in uh, um, domain of contracts. Um, we also call for creating a uh, more legal summarization corpora. Uh, great. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we have time for a question or two. Uh, let me just uh, check on the chat. Okay. Don't see anybody. Uh, I actually have uh, one, one question about your, uh, the way you Compile the corpus. So I, I noticed you put the terms of service collection in with the uh, with the privacy policies. Uh, do, do you look at risk as one inherently uniform concept, or are there different types of risk in terms of the the actual outcome? You know, there, there's a risk and there's an outcome that someone's trying to avoid, right? So how how did you look at risk in, in that way? So for um, for the purpose of our work, by risk we mean like the average internet user's perception of risk. So here we uh, define risk based on what uh, TOSDR contributors actually had annotated um, different uh, snippets uh, by like. So like if they had annotated a snippet as bad or blocker, um, we uh, we co um, consider that snippet as uh, a risky. Section. So basically, uh, to answer your question, yes, a, a uniform um, definition of risk based on average internet users' perception of risk. Okay, no, that's interesting. You know, as opposed to like, you know, one category, my data will be stolen. Number two, my computer will be hacked. You know, number three, something else. That's interesting. Um, thank you. Uh, oh, there is a question uh, here. Uh, why not just highlight high-risk sentences in the original document? Do we really need to produce summaries? And so I guess the question is about your motivation of making the summaries. Um, so yeah, previous work on privacy policies has worked on um, like uh, highlighting the privacy policies uh, with different uh, risk colors. And um, so the intuition behind like using summarization was that um, users would um, benefit more if they just uh, well, can also control the length. So if they, for example, want to spend like one minute on reading the contract as opposed to like going to, to our the, through the entire um, uh, contract and see like different risk levels. So um, that was the intuition behind um, creating a summary. However, um, uh, I think one main gap in this uh, line of work is that there's no um, user study to study like w what is the preferred mechanism that users want to be, actually go through these contracts. Uh, and um, I hope that answers the question. Uh, yes, I think there's one more question after that we'll have to move on. Uh, how would a data risk officer's view of risk be incorporated differently from the current definition. So I, I would summarize that as uh, a, a data risk officer's view versus that of the general public. Mm, um, so um, 
if I understand that question properly. <laughs> yeah, so I think the question uh, asks like if, um, like for example, a lawyer's view of risk would be different from yeah. like, uh, an average user's uh, view. So yeah, they, there might be a difference, obviously, but um, um, and um, like our work is based on like the average uh, internet user's view. So um, that would be interesting to um, explore more and understand what are the differences and if um, um, and, and there actually exists a difference. But uh, this is not what, what we studied here. Great. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, we're going to move on to the next paper now. And our next paper is Entropy in Legal Language. Uh, that is going to be presented. Presented by uh, Roland Friedrich. Hello. My name is Roland Friedrich, and I'm going to present your joint work with Mauro Luzzatto and Professor Elliot Esch from ETH Zurich. Our work is entitled Entropy in Legal Language. First of all, let me thank the organizers for giving us the opportunity to present our joint work. The question we asked us is, how can we distinguish civil and common law from a purely quantitative perspective? So what are measures in order to disentangle the two. So there are two major legal systems. First of them is civil law, which is a continuation and refinement of ancient Rome's Justinian Code, which was updated by France, uh, especially by the Napoleonic Code. So this kind of legal system is predominant in continental Europe, as well in former Spanish and French colonies. Common law, on the other hand, originated in late medieval England and spread to former English colonies. So civil law is a system in which judges make decisions based on codified rules, while common law judges make decisions based on previous decisions. The German legal doctrine comes out of a civil law system. It was heavily influenced, especially after the second half of the 19th century, by the development of natural sciences. Code-based legal writing requires technical language, efficient and standardized mechanisms of referencing common to all scientific writing. There is also the old debate on legal traditions, especially on efficiency of the common law system. So the motivation for our work was, can we potentially distinguish case-based decision-making uh, as in common law from code-based decision-making as in civil law, purely using methods from information theory. So our working hypotheses are that legal language should have lower entropy than general language due to the higher precision and technicality. Relative to common law, civil law has lower local entropy. It is more precise, technical, and it's a functional language. So in general, let us add the following comments to entropy in language. It was Claude Shannon in his 1951 paper, Prediction and Entropy of Printed English, which initiated the information theoretic study of natural languages. Since then, there is a, almost an industry of this kind of endeavor in linguistics. The model underlying language from a mathematical uh, perspective is that language is generated by a stationary and ergodic stochastic process, and the Lampert-Sieff algorithm should consistently estimate the entropy lower bound for st stationary ergodic process. Previous applications of entropy in linguistics include, which are for our work important, Montemuro and Zanette, who looked at the kulbach leibler divergence which is a measure of relative entropy between shuffled and unshuffled text. And they showed that this relative entropy is a structural constant across all languages they considered. So what does that mean? We will come back to the question. Basically, it means that you take a text, you compress it, you take a shuffled version. That means that you reorder the word order 
and then you compress it again, and then you compare the two figures. Benz et al., they considered Unicum word entropies and showed that they follow a unimodal distribution, and they measured it across more than 1,000 languages. Finally, De Gaetano and Ortlieb and Teich, they used trigram language models to track evolution of entropy in scientific English corpora, and they showed that it became increasingly optimized as a code for written communication by specialists. So, in a broader perspective, which relates more to the current workshop, let us talk about other work in law, which use quantitative methods. So, Ash Chen, Ash and Chen, they investigated legal language and judicial reasoning in federal appellate courts using doc to vec So they considered the word geometry. Katzenbomarito explored several methods for measuring complexity in law, and they applied it to the U.S. federal statutes. And finally, Klingenstein, Hitchcock, and Tedeo did a large-scale quantitative analysis of transcripts of the London Old Bailey by using the Jensen-Shannon divergence and showed that the violent and the non-violent offenses became increasingly distinct, reflecting a broad cultural shift which started around 1800. So now let's talk about the methods and the data we applied and used. So our analysis is based on the U.S. Supreme Court rulings and the German Bundesgerichtshof decisions as well as the aligned Europal corpus in German and English. The main tool or main mathematical entity we use is the Shannon entropy. So this is the, the basic definition which uh, is, is in a sense standard, but from our perspective it is noteworthy to point out that entropy can be either considered as a local or global observable. By local it means that we look at the entropy of a word in a context, so we measure in a sense, it's temperature, or we can use entropy as a global observable, then we measure the, the temperature, so to speak, of a text. So let us discuss our results. First of all, we also looked at shuffled and non-shuffled sentences and their compression rates, and we did that for all corpora. And what we observe is that the, the optimal the best compression rates we obtained for the German BGH followed by the English Supreme Court. And as we see, and this is a nice proof of, of having a, a good translation, the Europal German and English are fairly identical. And we see as we shuffle the text, as explained previously, the entropy increases. That means we destroy structure and, and uh, we see that the compression becomes less good as compared to the original text. So this is a macroscopic observable which, which shows already uh, that our, I mean, this is a hint towards our hypothesis. So the next thing we considered is the compression rates for the US Supreme Court. So basically we plotted the compression rates for the time period starting in 1924 up to 2013, and we see that it, it's tendentially it starts to decrease. So, so or that which means that it becomes higher, more structured. Our hypothesis is that this is based on on an increasing use of statutes, also in the U.S. Supreme Court system. And uh, an, an increased formalized way of, of writing uh, the, the, stat, uh, the, the, the rulings. In order to compare the three, legal, the, the three courts and, and the, the two legal systems we, we are looking at, the Bundesgerichtshof and the Supreme Court, we calculated the empirical cumulative distribution functions for the local entropy values. So, what does that mean? So, we used our word to vec model and calculated the entropy per token. A token in our case is either a word, a bigram, or a trigram. And then we, we ordered them by increasing values and, and uh, obtained the distribution, the, cum the empirical cumulative distribution function. 
And what we see is that the Supreme Court's uh, function is strictly below the BGH, BGH's curves, either of the Strafsenat and the Zivilsenat. And this kind of behavior in physics, if you have a ferromagnetic system, is called a hysteresis. And we see this reminiscent figure that both start at the same point, they end at the same point, but one curve is strictly below the other. So this is a very strong indication for our hypothesis that there is a, a quantitative and qualitative difference in the behavior of the two systems. Second, in order to, to have a, an idea how good the method works, we used as a comparison or as a baseline, so to speak, we used the Europal in German and English. I mean, these are the, this is the same text translated from German to English and, and did the same thing. We also calculated the empirical cumulative distribution functions and we compared it. And as our hypothesis uh, was, we assumed that the, the legal writing should have less entropy as compared to the writing in, in, polit in politics. And, and the, the curve seems to indicate that uh, it is indeed the case. So we see that the uh, Europal two curves are quite similar. And we did the kolmogorov smirnov test. And by that, it, 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 they, are, they are indistinguishable. And we see that they are below all the, the, the curves of the BGH and the Supreme Court. Let us conclude our presentation with the following remarks and conclusions. So the writing style in civil law has lower relative entropy than common law as for the US Supreme Court and the German Bundesgerichtshof. And it is also true that it, um, I mean, this was calculated with respect to a neural language model and global entropy. So in with, with respect to both measures, we see this this distinction. Then civil and common law writing styles are distinguishable on a purely information theoretic basis. That was our challenge, our goal to show that and the data and our results uh, appear to uh, give credence to that. Our results are helpful from, from the perspective of history and social science. Um, and finally, as an outlook for the future, uh, deep neural language models for could be helpful and uh, for a final spatio-temporal resolution of information distribution different linguistic scales and uh, this is all left for the future thank you again for your attention no problem Roland. thank you that was uh, really interesting and we have uh, a couple minutes for questions um, does anyone on the chat have a question i don't see anybody um, one question I had, you, you mentioned that you are going to look at neural models. Um, you used word to vec for this, right? Yes, yes, uh, we used word to vec yes. Did you think about using ELMO only because in comparison to word to vec ELMO is uh, the idea is that we'll extract different meanings, right, of the same yeah, word? Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, for this project, we, we started out with word to vec but, but currently we are using more, uh, more recent tools, yes, yes, we, we do that, yes. I think that'll be very interesting um, and also interesting because of the difference in frequency among some of these legal terms and often the embeddings don't do as well on very low frequency words or don't bring out all the different meanings in them. So it'll be interesting to see what happens in the future. Yes, yes. That, that is certainly uh, something to, to uh, yes. Hi, I have a quick question about the conclusion in your, uh, your first conclusion regarding the comparison between common law and civil law. Yes. Do you take into account any differences in the language itself? I mean, US is in English and BGH is in German. Yeah, I mean, that, that's why we use this baseline. 
So we, we had the, the baseline is, a, is the same text in German and English, it's a translation. And then when you do that, you see that the, 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 the distribution is almost identical. So the, the slight difference you find comes from, from language-specific uh, language uh, differences. And, and the big difference, that, that, that's not given by, by, it's not coming from the language, but it's coming from the use of the language. So, and you see it also at the global compression rates, you see that the, the German text is much more structured. I mean, a German court ruling is basically like a scientific paper, so it's very structured. You have a heading, you, 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 have, a, you have the section where you recall uh, what happened, and then you have a discussion of the text, and the discussion is very technical. That means that it's almost like a, a mathematical paper, it says, this this was violated then it then, then there is a, a link to to the ruling or to the code in the in the book and this is like it, it's very much like scientific writing and then it goes on and then it comes uh, to the conclusion so this is uh this is not coming this big difference is not language given it is a uh, structure given by by how it is used Okay, great. Um, so right now we're going to take a five-minute break before we move on to the next two uh, short papers. Uh, so join us uh, back here in five minutes. And Roland, uh, okay, I guess we can get started again. If everyone can hear me, our next uh, paper is going to be Finding Contextually Consistent Information Units in Legal Text, and Dominic Seiler will be presenting. So, uh, the speaker's ready. You can go ahead anytime. Hi. Thanks, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. We can hear you. Hi. Um, my name is Dominic Seiler. I'm from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and today I'll be talking about finding contextually consistent information units in legal text. Um, this is joint work with my advisor, Cheng Jai, and Paul Bruin and Pavan Bayapu from Regology. Um, the motivation behind this work is as follows. Um, terms in the law of a legislature can be highly contextual. So, for example, 26 USC states that for the purpose of Title 26, the term person shall be construed to mean and include an individual, a trust, or a corporation. Whereas uh, 42 USC, USC states that for purposes of the, su the subchapter, the term person includes one or more individuals, governments, or receivers. Note here that the first definition is applicable to the entire title, whereas the second definition is only applicable to the subchapter. Therefore, the context is not identical across the corpus. The goal in this work is as follows. We try to assist professionals when uh, reading legal texts by finding contextually consistent information units. And what these units are, I will explain later on. Our method is modeled to emulate what we call the contextualization process, um, which uh, is, has three separate steps. In the first step, the reader notices that the definition of person is not in the current section. In the second step, the reader needs to find a definition of person that is applicable to the current section. And since there are many definitions of the word person, the reader has to know which is the correct one that applies to the section that he or she is reading. In the final step, the reader needs also to understand which other sections the definition applies to. As I mentioned earlier, the goal of our work is to find um, cont contextually consistent information units, we call what, which we call root contexts. But what is a root context? Um, root context commonly represents an individual law on a specific topic. And it is used where a codified corpus's hierarchical structure does not des designate a single level for individual laws. So on the bottom here, we can see the graph of a um, hierarchical structure of a corpus where on the top level we have the title level, then the chapter level, subchapter level, and section level. What the edges mean in this graph I will describe later in, in greater detail, 
But for now, it is important to notice that there are three stars, which um, are root contexts identified by a method. And it's important to note here that root contexts can occur on different levels. In order to arrive at the graph we saw previously, we developed a three-step approach, where we start by building the hierarchy reference graph. We then find root context indicators, and we finally traverse the hierarchy reference graph to find root contexts. What these three steps mean, I will now explain in more detail. The first step of a method is to build the hierarchy reference graph. And we start by identifying all nodes in the graph, which we call hierarchy branches. And you can think of it as the path that you have to travel along the tree to get to the node under consideration. For example, if, um, this, if you want to, uh, to identify this node, you have to travel from title one to chapter one, and this will be the hierarchy branch. For example, or another example would be subchapter three, where you would have to tra travel from title one to chapter two, and then to uh, subchapter three. Uh, we, we then find hierarchy references in section text using a, a simple regex. For example, if we are in section 30, and that text in the section talks about um, this subchapter, we build an edge between section 30 and subchapter 3. The edge weights in this graph symbolize how many times a certain section has referenced a particular note in the hierarchy. For example, if section 30 has eight references to subchapter 3, um, the edge weight will be 8 here. Since we start at the section level, which is the only level that contains text, we start aggregating for each hierarchy level moving upwards. So, we, for example, we start by um, counting the references in the sections, we then move upwards to the subchapter level, then to the chapter level, and finally to the um, title level. And we, we uh, aggregate accounts on each step. The second, the second step of our approach is finding root context indicators. These are um, references in certain sections which contain definitions of purposes, and those carry more weight than regular sections. And we define a set of regular expressions, which you can see in the table, which extract the hierarchy references in these sections. So if uh, one of the regular expressions matches the text within a section, the hierarchy branch for the extracted references is considered a root context indicator. So for example, if we are in a section titled definitions, we use, and the text says, um, this chapter describes something. Um, we know that the chapter, it would be an indicator of the root context and the chapter would be uh, captured by the regular expression you can see here. And the final step, we traverse the hierarchy reference graph until we identify our root context. And we do this as follows. For every node in the graph, we perform multiple hops following the outgoing edge with the highest weight. If a node points to itself, we consider it a root context. If a node has no outgoing edges, we move to the node's parent and continue the procedure. Um, for, so for example, if we start at section one, we follow its, um, its edge to chapter one. Since chapter one points to itself, we consider that a root context. Similarly, if we start at um, section 30, we follow its edge to subchapter three. Since subchapter three also points to itself, we consider this a root context as well. In order to evaluate a method, we perform experiments and our experimental setup looks as follows. We have five different corpora, which are United States Code, California law, Texas statutes, Illinois compiled statutes, and consolidated laws of New York. You can see the statistics of our data set on the right, where the left column has the data set name, the second column has the total number of nodes in the graph, third column has the number of root contexts that, is, that are identified within each corpus, which is um, a subset of all nodes in the graph, and the right column shows the percentage of root context of all nodes in the corpus. In order to create this uh, gold standard data set, we make use of an expert which, who annotates each node as whether it is a root context or not. So for each node, the annotator would give it a one or zero label. Um, in order to evaluate um, our method, we use standard metrics 
which are F1 score, precision and recall of the class under consideration, and classification accuracy. Our experimental results look as follows. On the right, you can see a table which shows our data sets and the performance of our method on each of the data sets. We find that our method generally achieves high precision, greater or larger than, uh, uh, larger or equal to 0.95. Recall is also high for our state corpora, as can be seen here, uh, less so for our one federal corpus. And the accuracy is close to one for all of our corpora. Finally, I would like to conclude that we introduced the problem of finding contextually consistent information units, and we developed methodology to find these units automatically. In our evaluation, we showed that our method achieves high precision and F1 score over multiple data sets. Since the method is unsupervised, it does not require any manual work and can therefore be applied broadly to all such application domains. This work further um, aids Regology's machine learning framework on three fronts. The first one is we successfully built a keyword extraction algorithm, and our method was increased to our method was used to increase the performance of existing information retrieval components, and it was also used to extract topics. With this, I would like to thank you all for your attention. If you would like uh, to learn more about my research, you can visit me at dominicsaylor.com. And now be, I would like to take your questions. Thank you. Great, thank you, Dominic, for a very nice talk. Uh, we have two minutes for questions. We have a question here. Do you have any speculations on the difference in F1 on the U.S. court versus your other corporate? Um, uh, yes, so we, do, we did find that I think there were um, less hierarchy references, if I can remember correctly, in USC, and therefore there was, um, therefore the method wasn't working as well. But in our paper, we also discussed in the future work section that it might be possible to, um, instead of using these hierarchy references, to look at the development of the, the law over time and then compare basically which, which sections of text have been inserted and we can basically de derive the, the, um, these references from there. Hope that answers the question. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, I think, uh, thank you very much, um, Dominic. Thanks a lot. For your we are going to move on uh, now to the uh, final talk uh, in this session, uh, which is going to be actually um, a recorded talk. And uh, that is going to be uh, the gap between deep learning and law, predicting employment notice. This is given by Jason Lamb. And uh, we are going to have to just start that remote talk in a second. There we go. Hoping everybody can uh, see that. Uh, so let me switch my... Um Hello, my name is Jason. I'm here with the Conflict Analytics Lab from Queen's University to present our paper on the gap between deep learning and law, the prediction of reasonable notice. In this presentation, we're going to be starting off with the motivation and the problem statement, followed by the data and the models we used. And then we're going to be ending with our results, a discussion of our results, and a summary of our contributions. The concept of reasonable notice is an incredibly important one in employment law, as it allows employees a sufficient amount of time and resources to be able to secure alternative and similar employment upon termination. We also wanted to be able to create something that could provide the general public and access to justice as many are often unaware of their rights when it comes to notice. And they're also unaware of whether the notice that they had been offered or the notice that they had received was indeed reasonable. Particularly in Canada, uh, the originating source of precedence for reasonable notice was Bardal v. Globe and Mail, which in 1960 determined 
it was decided that the following four factors would be the most important in determining the amount of reasonable notice a person should receive. Although these were determined to be the most important factors, it was not determined on how these factors should be utilized or whether all these factors must be utilized. Um, co further compounding this, uh, this issue of ambiguity in the case law, uh, the precedents in employment law, despite can or in reasonable notice, despite Canada being in a common law system, it is only persuasive and not necessarily binding, which further leads to more inconsistencies in the judgments. Formally, we would be classifying the number of reasonable notice a person would receive using free text case summaries. We utilize the classification approach as we believe that this best represented the thought process of the judiciary. Uh, given Canada's common law system, we believe that a judge would be most likely identifying a precedent that is most similar to the current case being presided over and then adjust adjusting their judgments based on the differences of fact. Um, for our classification approach, we had about 25 classes where we grouped classes of 24 or greater into a singular class. We did this as it was there was a long held belief in Canada that there is an unofficial soft cap of 24 months being the maximum amount of reasonable notice that you could receive. Below you can see our data processing pipeline in which we took in case summaries from Westlaw, prepended additional information, and then in inserted it into our deep learning models. The data that we worked with was primarily from the Westlaw quantum summaries. We utilized summaries as we only required the facts of the case as well as our most of our pre-training models had a limitation of 512 tokens, which made the full case text rather too, uh, too long for us to be able to work with. There were also inconsistencies in the structuring of the case text, which made it difficult for us to automatically parse and extract the facts. We would have to remove any mentions in the analysis as that's something we were trying to replicate, as well as the conclusion as that was ultimately what we were trying to predict. The summaries were much shorter, making it a lot easier for us to trim where we manually removed mentions of the analysis and the judgment. Previously, we mentioned we prepended additional information to our summaries. We only prepended information that would be readily available prior to a case going to court, such as the year of the judgment, the occupation category of the plaintiff, their age, their salary, so on and so forth. In total, we had about 1,700 cases for training and 409 for testing. We did not utilize a traditional development set as we did not believe we had enough data for us to be able to create a representative development set in addition to our testing set. Instead, the results that we report are as a result of the final model uh, from, the, from the last epoch in each iteration. The first model we implemented for our deep learning benchmarks were this, was a few shot model. A few shot model is specifically designed to be able to learn and generalize a certain class based on only a few training examples. Uh, given our small data set and given that we had 25 classes, we felt that this was an appropriate approach for us to be able to classify reasonable notice. Furthermore, who at all in 2017 demonstrated that this would be, this was a successful approach in predicting criminal law cases. The second model we implemented was a hierarchical attention network. Given the natural structuring in our summaries where each sentence co roughly corresponded to a statement of fact, we felt that a hierarchical attention network might be able to weigh each fact individually and, and be able to take a holistic approach in being able to predict the amount of notice that a person would receive. Finally, we experimented with multiple transformer-based architectures, namely Roberta, and the different methodologies of domain adaptations. Recently, Devlin et al. introduced this concept of learning the language prior to actually reading and, and trying to classify out based on the language. To do this, we wanted to be able to give Roberta, who already had a generalized understanding of the English language, uh, an understanding of the legal language. To achieve this, we domain adapted using two different sets of corpus. The first being the Harvard dataset, which comprised about 4.4 million cases, which um, of which we removed cases that were prior to 1960, as we felt that those cases were too linguistically different. We also like to note that these were American cases, which do rather share a lot of similarities with the Canadian cases. Uh, the second domain of which we domain adapted on was the original case, full case text of our summary 
uh, of the cases in our sum in our training data set. So we domain adapted on roughly about 1700 full case texts. This is a summary of our results of which we report accuracy with a plus or minus two window to help address some of the inconsistencies in the case law. What this means is we classify something as correct if it was within plus or minus two months of the ground truth. Uh, we know our best performing model was our Roberta base model with a 69% accuracy followed by our hierarchical attention network model at 67%. Uh, for our first specific use case, our domain adaptations did not yield better performance and actually negatively affected our performance. Um, our results from our Roberta, data, uh, Roberta experimentations also seem to be in line with the findings of Liu et al, which emphasize the core importance of quantity of data over the quality of data. In summary, we showcase several neural methods to tackle an important issue in law, namely the prediction of reasonable notice. Our best performing model was Roberta Base, which had a 69% accuracy with our plus or minus two window. We also experimented with different sources of legal data for pre-training, and, and our domain adaptations did not improve our performance. This has led us to believe that the current state of deep learning might not necessarily be suitable for predicting reasonable notice due to the subjective nature of the issue. Thank you for listening, and this is our contact information if you had any questions, and as well as our citation list. Thank you for listening to our presentation. Okay, great. I do see that the author is online, so um, we can take questions in the chat.